Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome everyone here for uh, this uh, day's event and this day's inquiry. Uh, maybe you should have uh, held your uh, um, clapping for the end part of the day's event uh, because you might find that it is not really worth clapping for what you receive. On the other hand, you might find it of some value. So let us uh, begin with a, a gentle exercise which really gathers our consciousness and our awareness to this point, to this place in space, so that we may begin our inquiry uh, as a group and not as many different individuals pulling in different directions with parts of our consciousness still on trains, buses, cars, or whatever other aspects of your life you have had to uh, cross before you arrived here. So close your eyes, place your hands on your thighs, Sit comfortably on your chair. Bring the awareness to the brow of the forehead at the root of the nose. And there acknowledge yourself by saying, I now gather all my faculties to this point, to this place in space. Acknowledge your physical body resting upon the chair. See there relaxed and at ease. Visualize now a point of violet light in front of you in the distance. See this point of light coming closer and closer to you. It is now right in front of you. Bring it right through into your sphere of influence, in your aura, and then deeper inside into your physical body at the point of the navel. Let your awareness focus upon this point of violet light and let us take a comfortable deep breath and as we breathe in, let us breathe in this violet energy and in the out breath, see the point of violet light expanding in every direction. Let us do that now again. See now this point of light to have expanded into a sphere of violet light incorporating the lower abdomen, your genitals, the lower back, all around the lower trunk of your body, coming outside in front and also a little outside at the back. It is a sphere with the center, the navel. With your awareness inside that sphere, acknowledge it to represent your physical world at one level and simultaneously your personality as a whole at another level. Turn now your inner eye of awareness upwards and as you do so, observe your physical world, observe this physical sphere and beyond it, any feelings that may arise. Let them pass away, do not engage with them. Bring the awareness to the point at the center of your chest. And there, visualize that you breathe in a rose-white light. Let us take three deep breaths. And with each in-breath, 
concentrate the rose white light and see it expanding, creating yet another sphere. Let's begin now. Let this fear symbolize for you your emotional world on the lower plane and your spiritual individuality on the higher plane. See this fear to encompass the whole area of your chest, your shoulders, your higher back, your arms, coming out in front of your chest and also behind your back and linking with the violet sphere. Turn now your inner eye once again even higher upwards and place it at that point which has no particular fixed abode that state of being that has its center everywhere and its circumference nowhere, that aspect of the self that we call the spirit. The watcher, the source of all and everything in your world. See it now being focused at the point within the center of the head and there, taking three deep, comfortable breaths, visualize a golden light that is being concentrated and creating this third sphere that surrounds the whole head with its center, the center of your brain, interpenetrating the rose-white sphere. Let us do that. Let this fear symbolize your mental world and simultaneously your highest spiritual divine self. See the three spheres interlinked and see a brilliant dazzling white light blinking from above, penetrating through every sphere and declare now to yourself with your awareness at the center of all three spheres, within the center of your head, center of your chest, and at the navel, I now acknowledge the threefold aspects of the self, the personality, the individuality, and divinity. Being present, in the three worlds of the physical, emotional, and mental. Be at ease, in peace, be here now. Open your eyes. Thank you. Well, five more. Let us give a couple of minutes this uh, people to arrive and uh, be seated, and we will start the order of our work.
got one more over here. Can I do the same? If I was feeling brave, that is. If I felt not so brave, perhaps I would only have put my hand up for the first, being a beginner. It is such a vast subject matter that we can always only really be beginners. Every step that we take is the beginning of another new inquiry. Are we all settled? Everyone now is here. That's good. For those that arrived late, all that you have actually not participated in is simply the acknowledgement of uh, the self and its various aspects being present here in this place in space and being able to gather one's faculties to really be prepared to inquire in such a vast and serious subject matter as what we are having as our task today here. It truly is the West's yoga. In the East, there are many different types of yogas, and each of these yogas has a discipline that stretches back for many, many thousands of years, and teachers who order the various essential teachings and practices of their particular discipline in such a way as they gradually introduce their students to ever deeper inquiries of the self. For every yoga, it's nothing else other than a means and a way by which we, human beings, bring about union with the self. The one self that manifests itself in the multiplicity of itself in the billions of human individuals. It's the same for the yoga of the West. The one thing that we have to clarify is that why should the East have a different style of yoga than the West? And very often, because the Western schools of thought and philosophy and religion somehow have lost their inner traditions or they have not made the inner traditions available, a lot of the Western students turn their heads and their interests to the Eastern studies and adopt various types of yogas which may or may not be uh, harmonious with the actual conditions of life in the West. It is very, very easy for an Easterner to be very contemplative, live in some nice hut up in the Himalayas, and really enjoy uh, the contemplative life that may be required by one of the different types of yoga. But of course, in the West, our conditions are very different. We live in a world of pressure, of stress, of fast bustling and hassling, and clearly, we have to find some kind of a system, some means by which a short period of time can be allocated to the inquiry, to the depth of uh, searching for the self that may produce a maximum kind of result, i.e. use the law of economy to invest the least and get the most. And this is not, is it not the way that the uh, Westerners think? How to get rich quick, how to get enlightened immediately and how to really uh, become uh, older before you have been born. I mean, this is the sort of style of our uh, life. And uh, that may be the phenomena of it, but in reality, behind every phenomena, there is actual reality. In the same way that we serve the light of the sun, and then you have a tree, and then you have a shadow of a tree, the shadow is actually the phenomena of the existence of the tree and the light. And it is the same with this phenomena of the pressure and hassle and bustle of the Western world. It is born out of the reality that in the West, the actual races that are occupying the Western world are designed in their makeup of bodies to really conquer the material world, not escape it. You understand that in the East, they all endeavor to escape matter into spirit, to abandon matter. Matter is an illusion, the Vedantists say. Matter is Maya. And therefore, we must escape it, must leave it behind, and enter the world of spirit. But in the West, we are 
really designed by physical manifestation, the, uh, the kind of uh, nervous system that we have and the various faculties are endeavoring to unfold the mastery of matter, the conquering of matter, so that we may become lords over the dimension of the material world and not simply escape it. I don't suggest by saying that, that in the Eastern world, those who really understand the Eastern mysteries endeavor to escape matter. It is only those that live in the exterior of the inner mysteries of the East that understand it or interpret it in that way. The reality, of course, is that there is one life manifesting itself in various aspects, and what a beautiful thing it is. Imagine if all human beings only unfolded the same thing at the same time. Evolution will be an enormously much longer journey than it already actually is, and it's long enough as it is. However, it would have meant that we, human beings as a whole, would have to suffer being away from our divine heritage for a much longer period, really experiencing the sorrow and the pain that one who is in exile of its own heritage has to experience. And therefore the wise leaders and guides of humanity have endeavored to encourage different races of man to unfold different faculties and different qualities, thereby each different race benefiting as being members of the whole humanity of the qualities that each race has actually unfolded. Therefore, as a whole, we are actually moving much more in a, an accelerated way than we might have done if all humanity simply was focusing its attention on one faculty or one quality. Therefore, in the West, we may be unfolding more the mental aspect that conquers the concrete uh, uh, material world, and in the East, they might be unfolding more the faculty that has to do with uh, the intuitive perception of uh, the inner life. However, this does not in any way uh, block the Easterner or the Westerner to also benefit and unfold in his present incarnation, in his present life, the uh, teachings and the truths that belong with the East or the West. But the truth is also that if a student, before he becomes an expert in one field, he starts moving from one discipline to another and trying to skim the surface of things, he will only end up being a doubler and not actually penetrate deeply into what is there to be uh, discovered. And so it is necessary that we actually select in accordance with our temperament, in accordance with our nature, a particular pathway, a particular field of inquiry, a particular discipline, and maintain our interest and our attitude and our will to discover, to research, focused upon that until such time as we become well versed in it, then we may actually expand our horizons and draw the richness that other systems and other different disciplines may have uh, to offer. So in that way we can synthesize as I have said, the richness that different peoples, different races, and different disciplines unfold for the benefit of the whole of humanity. Let us now come to our subject matter of the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah in itself, it is said that it was the inner mystery teaching of the Hebrews, of the Semitic races. However, in all different parts of the world, one will find different forms of this particular form of teaching. It is said that it was given to Abraham by a great king known as Melchizedek. He was the king of Salem. Clearly, Salem meaning peace, the king of peace. We also know that the Christ was known as the prince of peace. And the Christ also always said that it is because of my father that I actually do what I do and not because of myself. And so you can clearly see that Abraham and the whole uh, mystery of uh, Melchizedek, who had no father and no mother, and appeared, gave the teaching and disappeared, may be perhaps an allegory, perhaps uh, a truth. We have to realize that all scriptures contain within them the different types of interpretations, an interpretation that has to do with a spiritual uh, aspect of what it contains, 
another interpretation that has to do with the mystical aspect of what it contains, another interpretation that has to do with the allegorical aspect, and finally with the literal aspect or historic aspect. In that sense, unless we are able to turn the key several times, we may actually not get the whole truth that is available in any of these scriptures. The whole history of the Kabbalah, which in itself means in our English language to receive, and that's why I say that if you study something to receive, you have to turn the key several times in these ways and be aware that there is a mystical, spiritual, and uh, allegorical and literal interpretation. Else, you may only close your mind to the other possibilities. The whole history of the Kabbalah is actually an unfolding journey and what tradition had to offer may not be what the present Kabbalists actually offer to their students because the tree of life as it is known has been growing, has been giving birth to uh, other trees and certainly each tree contains within itself the wealth of produce that it has been able to bring about. As it was said by one of the Kabbalists that in each acorn there is the potentiality of the whole tree and then the whole tree contains many acorns which repeat the cycle, etc., etc. And that is the same with the whole symbolism of the Kabbalah. Its history has been very much following the same phase of how religions follow, how nations follow. There is a rising tide and there is the fall of the tide. And there is a great interest in a particular teaching and then it falls away again into obscurity. And then it arises again and it follows this kind of wave of ebb and flow in the same way as this particular tradition has done from the time of Abraham then resurrected by Moses and then resurrected again by Ezra and then further in our more recent uh, uh, past by uh, Simon Ben Johan and later on by uh, Moses de Leon in the approximate 12th century uh, Spanish Kabbalist. However, each of these have only really been able to touch fragments of the whole vast subject matter that we are looking at. So if we are to say that today, in a few hours that we have available, we are going to penetrate at all the different levels of what this particular symbol, who you see uh, on this whiteboard, has to offer, clearly we'll, we will be mistaken and we will be making a grave mistake because the whole essence of the Kabbalah is really the means by which we can bring about in our own human consciousness the realization of the macrocosmos and the microcosmos. And clearly, that in itself already gives a sense of the vastness because the macrocosmos includes the whole solar systems, the planetary systems, the galactic systems, and the microcosmos includes everything and anything that there is to be known within the very nature of the human self. And so in truth, like in all other traditions, as it was said, know thyself, it is the same that it is said in the tradition of the Kabbalah. And the self is seen microcosmically to be the human and macrocosmically to be the cosmos, the universes. In that sense, clearly, we have a long way to go and so relax and for those that may find some interest in this subject matter, you have a lifetime of study if you so choose and probably many incarnations along with that. It's not really something that uh, uh, you just pick up a book, you learn uh, the symbolisms and uh, clearly now you are a Kabbalist. I certainly have been studying for many years and I uh, am not uh, too proud to say that I have only scratched the surface of what is available. Therefore, how did this symbol, this tree of life, actually arose? We said that this possibly it was given to us by some higher intelligence. But even if it were given by some higher intelligence, how did the actual tree as it stands here today unfolded. Surely there must have been some process that brought it into this particular shape and form. What do you actually see here? You see uh, ten spheres, 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And um, you see some lines connecting them. Surely we must ask ourselves, what is the symbol of a circle or the symbol of the sphere uh, tells us? What does it mean for us? Because I want to inform you that really the whole mystery of the Kabbalah is a study of symbology, numerology and the world. And unless you are prepared to really focus your faculties and try and interpret symbols, perhaps there might be another way for you that might be of more value and of more uh, profit for yourself. However, in this particular uh, tradition or this particular system, it is necessary that we use all our faculties to focus their attention upon the interpretation of symbols. The whole of the glyph is actually a symbol. It is a composite symbol and within it there are various other symbols. I have deliberately left it plain and did not add numbers and words and names and all of these things because I hope that throughout the course of the day we can actually add these things ourselves and create another tree, if you like, with all of this on the blackboard which we have right next to. So let us just begin How did we get this composite symbol of various circles which are known as spheres and their various connections? Clearly, someone at some point in the distant history tried to imagine the whole universe, the whole world, the whole life with some kind of symbol that has no beginning and no end. And the best symbol for that is obviously a circle because at any point of it you can see that it has no beginning nor end. It is a continuous and then it is said that it clearly must have a focus and when that particular focus or a point begins to vibrate you get actually the line and when it begins to vibrate in another direction you get another line and eventually you have the symbol of the encircled cross, but clearly we know that in the science have discovered that no lines, if you extend them at infinitum, will actually man maintain themselves as a straight line. They, there is a curvature and they actually return. And therefore what you get is this line returning. It's very difficult to actually... Um, draw it, and then that line also doing the same, and thus you have a three-dimensional sphere. You have a, a sphere which has the cross unfolding itself in its encircled method. This particular symbol is used by Kabbalists in one form or another to actually invoke the mysteries that may be held within the actual symbol of the encircled cross. It is said that even Jung has discovered through his research into various dreams of all the people that were actually ill and went to him for assistance, that when <coughs> they were about to get better, when they were actually just to a point where their particular illness was coming to an end, they had some kind of dream here in the West that pertained to an encircled cross. This encircled cross, they might have seen it sometimes as a, a circled rose, and other times the dream might have seen it as a circle of friends with which they were endeavoring to actually communicate in every direction, and other times as an actual sphere with a cross in the center of it. And these symbologies, he gathered all together and found that really that the human mind in the Western cultures has within its subconscious this symbol of the encircled cross very deeply engraved in its, in its psyche. And in, some doctor who had a very sick wife 
actually created a sphere with an encircled cross and asked her to stay within it just for a few minutes a day. And knowing behold, after a period of time, her particular illness had vanished and disappeared. Now, you can see that if we take that out and create another circle, and if we were to put a point here with our compasses and create another circle, with the center at any, it can be at any of the per point of the periphery of the actual circle, and then yet again here. You will find, for those that were here in the beginning, what we started with was the three actual spheres, which represented for us, on the one plane, the lower sphere, the physical world, and on another, our whole personality, and then the central sphere on the lower plane symbolizing our emotions and our feelings, and on another plane the individuality, and the third sphere symbolizing the actual mental world, and on a higher plane our spirituality or divinity. Then the same if you actually take from that point and draw another circle, you eventually, are going, I mean, because I am unable to actually create it accurately, you may not get a very uh, good impression, but I'm trying to give you a rough idea how someone who may not have a book or read anything about how this whole glyph began to expand and began to be created, how out of the concept of a circle with a point, slowly by adding more circles, and more circles eventually, if you actually sit down and do this yourself, when you get to the 18th circle, you're going to discover to the 18th series of circles by adding seven altogether, three in the center and four others making the seven circles, then they begin to repeat themselves and create the various symbologies, the various triangles and squares and uh, pentagrams and so on that the whole glyph uh, of the Kabbalistic tree of life contains within it. It is not possible for me to actually go on in this because we have so much matter to, to cover uh, that uh, I only want to introduce the idea for you to play at your own time at home. Simply start with a circle at a point, then take one of its uh, uh, points on the uh, surface of the perimeter, draw another uh, circle of equal uh, diameter, and continue drawing another three and continue on the other side and on the other side and continue this at infinitum and you will see that as you go on certain patterns and certain things will begin to become uh, uh, very evident. Now one of the other teachers in the history of life that uh, studied the Kabbalah certainly was Pythagoras and Pythagoras discovered that really you have the circumference and you have the diameter and the circumference to the diameter gives us the three, one, four, one, five, which we call pi, yes? Three, one, four, one, five. Now, what is very peculiar and very strange is that if you multiply one times three, three, three times four makes 12, and one times four, four, four times five, 20, 20 and 12 makes 32. And it's very interesting that the board falls down. That altogether, this particular glyph is known to have 32 actual paths, i.e. the 10 spheres and, then to, and the 22 that link the actual spheres, the 22 avenues or pathways. So even in numerology and the way the, the Pythagoreans studied this particular Kabbalah, discovered that the same principles that the ancient rabbis and uh, the ancient teachers had come to know, they also had unfolded them and gave them a different inclination and different interpretation, mathematically speaking. It is said that really God geometrizes itself by Plato. And Plato and Aristotle and all of these teachers of the Western culture 
they all were versed in the ancient mysteries of the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah is a composite teaching that brings and unites together the ancient Egyptian, the ancient Hebraic, and the ancient Greek. And clearly, we will find richness once we understand the principles and how to interpret these symbols of how they actually connect to the various aspects of our heritage in the distant past. One of the other things that you will see here is really what is known the three pillars. The three pillars are the one on the right, the one on the left, and the one uh, in the center. Now these three pillars have been given names to give an interest to those who are seeking to discover what they mean, uh, such as the pillar of equilibrium, which is the center pillar, the pillar of mercy, which is the one on your right, and the pillar of severity, which is the one on the left. These three pillars may be seen in another way as three pathways. And every human being who is researching or studying consciously the mysteries or unconsciously simply living his life, taking care of his duties, uh, being a student of philosophy or uh, working as a lawyer or working as a teacher or in some school or working as a, an artist, a painter or a musician, whether he knows it or not, he is traveling, if you like, upon one of these pathways, these three major pathways. The one on the right is known as the artistic pathway or the pathway of devotion. The one on the left is known as the scientific pathway. And the one in the middle is known as the pathway of sacrificed action. Sacrificed action. It is the most difficult route. It is the route that avatars, saviors, and great, great kings take. Most of us find ourselves in one form or another on the one on the right or on the one on the left. You will find that on the one on the left, such as uh, people as uh, uh, scientists of different uh, kinds, uh, scientists uh, of uh, mathematicians, uh, geometricians, architects, lawyers, um, judges, various people who really have to do with uh, using their mental faculties more than their emotional faculties. And you remember that in the earlier part of our exercise for those that were here, we talked of the three actual realms, the three worlds, the world of emotion, the world of mind, and the world of the physical body, the body of action. And it's the same with this th these three pillars. In one level, they have to do with the three different pathways for that we are finding ourselves, whether we are conscious of it or not. You may be simply um, a man who works in a practical way doing your garden. And you feel very uh, emotionally involved in the way it looks, in the way that uh, you plant your seeds and the way you take care and cultivate your garden. You may not be interested in the Kabbalah nor ever had the word itself. But still, being alive and being a human being, you are traveling upon this particular path which we are talking of, which is the artistic path or the devotional path. In the East, it might be called the path of the Bagda Yogi. The one on the left may be called the, the path of the Jhana Yogi. Jhana meaning the path of uh, knowledge. The Bagda Yogi meaning the path of uh, love or devotion. And the one in the center, you might call it Karma Yoga. But Karma Yoga that has to do with sacrificing the fruits of your actions to ask yourself, knowing my nature, observing myself, observing my nature, what am I more inclined towards? Am I more inclined to be a painter, an, uh, a musician, uh, a poet, 
Am I more artistically inclined? Am I seeing the way that I communicate with others is through my emotions mostly? Or am I communicating and relating with others mostly through my mind? And you will see where the focus of the attention of your consciousness may actually lie. In asking such a question, we begin to actually get a mirror reflection of where we actually stand. And the symbol of the tree of life, it is just that. It is a mirror for you to reflect into your own consciousness various aspects of realization of who you are and what you are. Another name for this glyph is the symbol of the vehicle of light. The vehicle of light. And as it is a vehicle of light, then clearly it is not the vehicle that one should be attached to. But one should be studying the vehicle with the inner attitude that seeks to touch the light and not simply to have a lot of facts and figures in one's head about the vehicle. And a lot of the Kabbalists end up doing just that. They collect an enormous amount of facts and figures and, and this word and that word and this other word and all and everything that belongs with each particular sphere and each path. But in the end of the day, they are just a huge big filing cabinet. And you know, we all have this actual mentality in our heads. We do have the filing cabinet mentality. When was the Battle of Hastings? Ah, there you are. So, you have a filing cabinet and somewhere in there there was this fact and the question is popped and you go there and you dig it out and here it is. But what real value does that have in your daily life? In what way can you make good use? of this, other than the fact that in having learned it, you have exercised in some way the faculty of memory. And so, it is true that these people that simply gather a lot of facts do have some benefit out of this practice. And the benefit is that they expand their memory capacity. Just like in a computer, we get a, a, an extra RAM to expand our memory capacity of the computer, so it is with a human being. You can get extra RAM the more you actually use the faculty of memory, the more information you endeavor to hold and remember and learn about, the more you expand the capacity of memory. But that is not the only thing that human beings are here to unfold. We are not really simply to become giant computers with vast memory capacity, but rather to realize the light that is within and the source of the light, because the light itself is not the source. The light has a source beyond it. Now, it is said that the light emanates from the first sphere like a lightning flash. But the first sphere, which is known as Kether or the crown, really is not the source of all and everything. It is the source for us human beings, for we cannot penetrate beyond that point of light. Because beyond that, there are three veils as they are said. These three veils are known as the limitless, the, noth the nothing, the limitlessness, and the limitless light. The nothing, the limitlessness, and the limitless light. These are three veils that veil the absolute. The absolute, what kind of conception can we have in our minds of the absolute? There is no... There is no mental capacity that we can actually grasp of the Absolute. So the wise teachers of the past have said that yes, there may very well be that which we can call the Absolute, but as we cannot fathom its depths and breadth, as we cannot commune with this Absolute, they have veiled it with three veils, and then out of those three veils begins the manifestation out of the unknown unknowableness, there is a crystallization of the first point from which the whole process of manifestation or expression begins. Out of the unmanifested comes the point of crystallization where there is the expression and manifestation of life. The unmanifested has, as we said, the center everywhere and circumference nowhere. This is a concept. How can you grasp the meaning and the value of that concept? Where does your mind stretch when you can think of something that has 
It's center everywhere in circumference nowhere. You cannot really grasp it, however much you try, yet it is a set of words, a concept, a symbol, with which we can begin to mystery dream rather than daydream. And certainly a lot of our lives is spent daydreaming, and this particular kind of study is a means by which we can start mystery dreaming instead of daydreaming. We can start actually occupying ourselves with aspects of our own self-realization rather than passing the time with useless activities that do not serve your purpose. So the lightning flash, as it is known, emanates out of this first point of crystallized light. And as it descends, it unfolds various aspects of its qualities. And these form the great spheres that you see here. The lightning flash moves this way, then there, then to this sphere, then back again, to that sphere, there, there, here, and down. It is known as the lightning flash. Now, you see, in the Bible, there is a reference to this in a different way. It was said that human beings lived in a paradise, a great paradise. In the mid this paradise was really an apple orchard, and in its center, there was an, a spring, a great spring, out of which four rivers flowed. And there were two trees, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. And it was said that really a snake enticed Eve to eat of the tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge meaning really learning about good and evil. And it was Lucifer that really manifested itself as the tree, upon the tree of knowledge as the snake, and clearly enticed Eve to eat of its fruit. And because of that fact, then human beings were expelled from the paradise and went out in the wilderness to discover their fortunes and to learn whatever there was there to learn. And that symbolically was known as the Great Fall. But Lucifer, which was expelled out of the paradise also and descended into the lower realms, you can see it symbolically why a tree. It is much easier to fall from the top of a tree than to actually climb up the tree. And so symbolically, the Kabbalists try to give us an impression of this lightning flash as it falls and manifests the various different spheres and how then the serpent slowly can actually climb because in another book or uh, a symbol you might see a snake actually surrounding itself slowly all around the spheres and climbing right up back the tree again. And clearly the snake also symbolically has to do with the... Uh, inner part of the human self that has descended like a lightning flash into the lower regions of materiality and slowly learning the experience that there is there to be learned will begin to awaken itself and slowly climb right back through the various spheres of consciousness and the various spheres of experience back to its ultimate heritage, to its birthright, to paradise, so to speak, again. And so we are all, if you like, serpents who are endeavoring to return back to our source from which we have come from. We have evolved into the depths of matter and slowly we are evolving out of the depths of matter back into the realms of spirituality. But in the process of so doing, we master and become lords of all the different aspects of matter. So our purpose as human beings is nothing more other than to rise upon the planes of consciousness, to rise upon the different dimensions of expression, to unfold in so doing the various potentialities that we have into actualities, to realize the emanations as the world 
that they create to realize that which they eventually form and to also realize the actual manifestations in the concrete plane. And so there is a ladder of going down and a ladder of going up. Jacob's ladder in the Old Testament has a reference to this whole process of how angels go up and angels go down. And in the same way, we as human beings can be thought of as angels that go down in the nether regions, learn all that there is to learn, and eventually we rise up. Now, gods were actually, it is said in the Bible, quite concerned and they expelled man out of paradise uh, before he actually had an opportunity to eat of the tree of life or the tree of uh, immortality, as it's also known. And it is that which we have to return to, i.e., through having experienced the eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, to realize all that that entails, and to attain the experience of the fruit of the tree of life, that which is known as eternity or immortality. And so the whole principle of the tree of life has to do with the process of involution and evolution of man as well as the process of involution and evolution of the cosmos. So it can be looked at microcosmically, as I said in the beginning, as well as macrocosmically. It also talks about four planes of existence. We have the ten spheres, the 22 paths that link the spheres, and then we have the four planes. One plane is what's known up, up here, the supernal triad. These three spheres form the supernal triad. And this plane is the plane of emanations. What is an emanation? An emanation is that which actually, as energy, expresses itself out of the source. Out of that emanation begins the process of creation. To create, you may have a brilliant impulse, a flash of energy towards to do something. Then you begin to create the whole uh, idea of how you're going to go about doing it. And then begin to actually form. Below, lower down, is the realm of formations. You begin to form all the different actual structures that will help you to actualize your original impulse or your original inception. So... The world of emanations can be thought of as the world of conception. Is that not how you also have started? You were first conceived, then the creation began to take place, then you were, your body was actually formed, and then after nine months you were actually actualized. And there are nine spheres below the one from which the first emanation comes. And nine months did you take to actually come forth into the realm of actualization. Here you are, after nine months you, are, you have appeared. Another name for actualization can be the appearance. Okay? So you have the emanation, the creation, the formation, and the expression or actualization or appearance. And you can see that with everything. You can see it in the planting of the seed, and the whole process that is involved there in the conception of an architectural idea which eventually manifests in the project of the Solomon's Temple or in the project of a, uh, a building in the city or whatever. Everything begins in the realm of that initial flash of inspiration. Then you conceive of the actual idea that pertains the whole process of creation, then it unfolds further down to forming all the different connections, links, and various uh, um, contracts, and so on, before the actual end product is actually manifested. These four worlds represent, really, the whole nature of our life. And everything that you may discover in your daily life will be related to one or other of these four worlds. Within each world, there is a tree of life. This whole tree of life can be interpreted or understood at the level of emanations, at the level of creations, at the level of formations, and at the level of actions. 
The Kabbalists talk of the level of Azeluth, Briach, Yetzirah, and Aziah. I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it very well. I'm not particularly um, versed in the Hebrew uh, text. And this is another thing I would like to say. It is not necessary that you waste or spend years of study of the Hebrew alphabet and the Hebrew language and the Hebrew uh, teaching so that you may benefit from the study of the Kabbalah. The study of the Kabbalah, it is not only a Hebraic system. It is a Western system, a yoga of the West, as I have termed it. And clearly, I may not be teaching the traditional type of uh, uh, Kabbalistic teachings, but certainly the essential principles are the same. But since that first and original inception, much has been added, we have said, to this uh, study. And clearly, anyone who begins an inquiry into the tree of life, if he certainly focuses his attention and with the right kind of meditative practices, he directs his faculties and his energies upon this symbol, soon enough he will begin to actually come in contact with all the different thought forms that have been created by all other human beings in the history of life that have associated themselves with this particular study. You know that most of us actually buy second-hand thoughts. We do not create our own. Kabbalah is so that you may learn to first of all come in contact with the second-hand thoughts, to interpret them, to understand them, but to go beyond that, to not be satisfied only with second-hand clothes that you wear, to actually create your own clothes, to actually create your own thoughts, to touch the very essence of the inner realm of emanations within you, and out of that, to create. Very often we talk of ourselves that we have this particular condition that we live in and it is not actually allowing you to give enough time to study and to give enough time to do all the things that you enjoy. And you say to yourself, well, I am a victim of circumstances. I tell you, you are not a victim of circumstances. You are a creator of the circumstances that you live in. And the moment you begin to alter this attitude of being a victim into one of a creator, then you place in your own hands, i.e. in your own consciousness, the key by which you can change these conditions. Because it is the same energy that you have used to create a condition that is now not favorable, that is now negative. The same energy can also be used to create an alternative condition that is more favorable. So when you look in yourself and you find various conditions that you no longer enjoy and you are no longer happy with, you are no longer interested in, you find them unfavorable to serving your purpose, do not try and blame some other external things, but acknowledge that you are the creator, and being the creator, you have the power, and you are the source from which you can emanate different energies in different directions, and create, and form, and bring about different conditions. So studying these four realms of emanation, creation, formation, and actualization, it is not something external, like a book that you read, or some study that is left outside. Because if that's all there is, as I have said, you will gather a lot of facts and figures and end up becoming a very large filing cabinet. You have to really internalize the teaching, as it is said, and begin to think and begin to use emotion and be begin to use the faculties that you have available so that you may actually become an active cooperator with the whole process of creation, and not simply a free ride. There is no free lunch, businessmen say. There's always the price to pay. And the price to pay for attaining the eternal kingdom of happiness is the work and the use of your faculties and the expression of the energies that you have as being alive. And clearly, this symbol offers us a composite means by which we can begin the whole process. And each of the spheres has in the realm of uh, emanations a particular word that we have called it the God word that actually gives expression to the realm of emanations. Another word that they have, the Kabbalists have termed it the archangelic name which gives expression to the realm of creations. And then below that, there is another word that gives expression to the realm of formations. And that's the angelic hosts. 
and below that there is another word that gives expression to the realm of actualities. And by trying to have these different points of references as these gods or archangels and angels and uh, uh, symbols, they are really points of reference so that our consciousness and our faculties, as they concentrate upon them, as they focus their attention upon them, we may actually break the seal of the symbol, so to speak, and enter into the meaning and into the actual essence of that emanation that they contain. Words are the same. What is a word? Let's say that uh, in this sphere, the word is eheye, in the Kabbalistic terms, in the top sphere, which symbolizes the realm of emanations. It is a god name, eheye. It means, I am that. I am. Now clearly, you can say I am. And you can say I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. And it is said that some students really go on simply studying by simply repeating the process of I am, I am, I am. I don't know about that. You may wish to try that uh, as an exercise to see where it gets you. It may hypnotize your mind. It may actually energize you. It may certainly do some phenomena. I'm sure any activity that a human being engages with will produce some type of phenomena or other. But in reality, I think that we have to try and penetrate beyond the actual appearance, as I have said, of a particular symbol. So let us use even the words that are meant to in incorporate the divine name or the divine God name as also symbols from which we endeavor to come in contact with the actual power or emanation that they represent. And not to think of these words as something that you bow to and start worshipping. Because you haven't got an idea of what it actually is. And therefore, what are you worshipping? When people worship God, what is God? Any God name. It doesn't matter what. I mean, clearly, we don't have any actual conception of what it is. Until we begin to study his creation, so to speak, and try to unfold out of his creation the essential qualities that may have to do with the, his, its maker, how can we actually understand what God is? And it's the same with anything. Whatever we create is a reflection of ourselves. And therefore, that is another thing that to bear in mind. Whatever you actually engage with in your life, see it as a reflection of the self. And therefore invest always the very best that you have available in whatever you do. Because it is a reflection of the self. The creation of the universe is a reflection of the one supreme life that we have given the name God. And so by studying the universe, we study God. By studying man, we study God. By studying God, we cannot actually get to grips with anything because... It is an abstract concept that only becomes realistic when you begin to have points of references, points of invocative expression, and points of actual communication. And this symbol, with all the words that are associated with it, and all the pathways, and all and everything that is related with, is a means by which you, as a human being, can begin the process of engaging in these mirror reflections of you as an aspect of life with other representations of aspect of life so that you may unfold out of that relationship the mystery of life. And so it is not to be seen only as a cold diagram of geometric nature but rather as a living symbol of life itself. Every word that you speak, you are actually going through the very same process as creation has gone through. Because you involve into the world the energy, the sound that is contained. He who actually listens, if he actually struggles with what that word means, what that symbol is, he may subsequently release that which you have invested into the world and experience the energy that you have infused into the world. So when we speak, 
we involve energy into the world. He who listens is to evolve the energy out of the world. So try and find various different examples and ways in your daily life of this process of involution and evolution going on. You are constantly involved in that process. You cannot avoid but being involved in that process. Everything. It's not only evolving or only involving. Involving means energy going into matter, as I have said, and evolving means energy releasing itself out of the constraints of matter. So spirit and matter are not two separate actual entities, but rather are one life unfolding itself in its denser realms or in its higher realms. So matter is a crystallized spirit, and spirit, uh, and spirit is actually a resolved matter. And so we are not here to avoid matter, but rather to conquer and master matter so that we make it so placid that whatever the will of the inner spirit is, it is unfolded. So to will it is to create it. And certainly part of the whole process of living will be inquired and investigated by he who is serious about the study of the Kabbalah. Anyway, it's uh, time to have a little break. And um, when we return after lunch, we will try and go into the depths of each of the spheres and try and understand what those different points of references that we've talked about on the different uh, four planes, i.e. the God world, the archangelic world, the angelic world, and the uh, physical symbol that uh, pertains to the world of uh, for, uh, actions, and try and get some kind of relationship with these terms in our daily life. If we have time, even we will try and actually go through some kind of ritual which makes these outer symbols more internal realizations so that we can see that everything that we actually learn, unless it is internalized in our own experience, is of very little value. It is only then information that we can uh, just uh, play in a party or impress a friend. It is an inner experience that we are to be interested rather than an outer appearance and demonstration. And so the whole process of actualizing the relationship between man and the different spheres of consciousness or the different states of life, it's an internal experience rather than an external appearance. And the process of studying the tree of life, it's really that. The rising of man's consciousness upon the different planes and different states of consciousness. Self-realization. Know thyself, the very first statement that was written in the antechamber of any school of mysteries worth its soul. Clearly, the whole process of this teaching is the same in every religion under different forms. Every religion has its outer form, it has its uh, qualities, and it has its inner mysteries. There is the life aspect, there is the quality aspect, and is the form aspect of every religion. And it was the same in the Hebraic terms as it is with the Christian terms and so on. You had really at the time of Jesus the, um, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes. The three different schools. One which was relating to the outer form, another with the various qualities, and the uh, Essenes which had to do with the inner mystery, the unseen, the unspoken, the unknown mystery of life. And the same with the actual teachings themselves. The Old Testaments... Uh, which is uh, the representation of the outer form, the Talmud, which is a collection of commentaries, and the Kabbalah. These are the three systems. And in every religion you have, as I said, the outer form, the inequality, and the actual source, the emanation, the spirit behind it. And it is for us to realize that it is that inner spirit that we should aim our attention upon, and not the outer form because the outer form vibrates on the law of separateness. And clearly, he who actually is, uh, is focusing his attention on the outer form 
will see himself to be utterly separate from another brother who is studying under a different system or sister. So Muslims fight the Christians and Buddhists fight the Hindus, etc., etc., because they are actually focusing their attention on the outer form of their religion and on the outer form vibrates always in separateness and diversity. But the inner spiritual essence vibrates on the, under the law of oneness and unity. And therefore, if we enter the realm of that inner unity, then we will be able to synthesize the various fruits, the various qualities that have come from all the different religions, all the different systems, all the different forms of inquiry into that eternal divine life that all the millions of human beings throughout the ages have endeavored to fathom and discover. And so the whole business of studying the Kabbalah is so that we may receive the inner initiation into the realm of direct experience with the Godhead. And each symbol each word, each ritual, it's nothing more and nothing less other than means to evoke and invoke in you, in yourself, different aspects of realization of the Godhead, of the divine one life. And if it is seen in any other way, then clearly you will only focus your attention on a part and not the whole. And it is only when you focus on the attention on the whole, though you study the part, that you will discover the whole in the part. Because the whole cannot be separate from the part. The eternal cannot be separate from the moment. The eternal is in the moment. But it is only when you are aware of the eternity in existence that you actually see the eternity in the moment. It is only when you acknowledge the beauty of all life that you can see beauty in all aspects of life, regardless of whether the outer form says it is ugly, the outer separateness says that it is bad or whatever. To see goodness in all things, to see light in all things, it is only when you have discovered the light within you. Because when the light within you shines through your eyes, when you look at something, you will see that which is of kind. And all and everything contains light within it. And the light has descended, as we said, in matter. And our whole business of studying, of living, of experiencing is to release this light out of this realm of matter and experience its beauty and its various qualities and its various aspects. And so light is in the atom, is in the cell of your body, in your heart, in your eyes, in the flower, in the grain of sand, in the diamond, in all things. It is only we who say the diamond is more important and more valuable than the grain of sand. Because there are more grains of sand and therefore automatically a diamond because there is less. And we think, human beings think in those terms. I wonder whether gods think in those terms. I don't know. I just ask the question. But we human beings, I discover, think in those terms. If there is more of something, then it can't be as valuable as that which is less of something. That which is less must be more valuable. But life is everywhere, so it can't be very valuable, huh? Anyway, thank you for listening to this part. And uh, have a nice lunch. And I'll see you again uh, in the second part, where we endeavor to discover a few more insights into this panoramic symbol. Thank you. Is it 2 o'clock? OK, 2 o'clock. Nottingham. Have you heard of Anthony Hallacy at all? 
Yeah. I heard of him, right. but I uh, have not met him. Right. I just wonder what system you use. I mean, he, he downs us to find out each person's electrical blockages. Hmm. Do you, do you sort of no, I don't use any external uh, system like that. Mm. I simply uh, work with people, and uh, through that relationship, one comes to know mm. what their difficulties are mm. and how best they may overcome. Because there are different. Um, actual methods that can release something in one that might be totally useless in another. Mm. You cannot find one uh, thing and say that's the panacea that can deal with mm. everything. Mm. And so dowsing may work for one thing but may not work mm. for other things. Yes. I feel that, uh, you know, as the old uh, teaching says, one man's meat might be another man's poison, yes. you know. Wow. And so clearly we have to uh, be willing to be students at all times mm. and seek to discover whatever is going to be the appropriate mm. response to any given condition, to any given circumstance, and mm. not assume that we have some means that applies to everything. Yes. And so uh, I, I, don't, I don't use any particular kind of system like that. I study the whole composite symbol, mm. and I uh, uh, endeavor to unfold all mm. its different aspects. Mm. Uh, and so that allows then the relationship between you mm. and me to not be fixed on you being the student, me being mm. the teacher, mm. but us being two human mm. beings mm. who are interested in the study of life. Yeah, and with that attitude, nice. we may be able to actually shed more light upon the darkness mm. rather than uh, you know, this separateness mm. that exists. That's why I said we have to realize that on the outer form, everything vibrates on the law of separateness. Mm. And it is only when you realize that that you go beyond and start seeing that there is just the one life unfolding itself in the multiplicity of yes. itself. Yeah? Yes. I think because with Mr. Halassi, he's been studying for so long, I think he's got a bit fixed himself hmm. as the teacher and everyone else as the student. Correct, yes. And, and it, it happens like that. Mm. It, that's one of the imprisonments of mm. the teacher. Mm. The teacher crea creates his own golden cage. Yes. And he thinks that the golden cage is not actually a cage because mm. it's got gold bars. Yes. yes. <laughs> All right? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think so.